Consciousness, the final frontier. These are the voyages into the universe between your ears. Our mission, to explore collective wisdom, seek out amazing secrets, and spread the message of personal potential. We're trying to create, make something perfect, it's not going to work. Right? They're just, they're, there's no congruency there. And so we have to kind of go into this deep place where what is, what is moving in me? What is this energy that's wanting to move through me? Um, it's always related to what your soul wants, right? Getting in touch with what is trying to evolve and move through me. And once I get a clarity on that, I understand where the block is and where that challenge is, is where I'm going to focus my attention so that that can open up and that can start to come through. So it does have to do with... Get, we have to get into our bodies. If we don't get into our bodies, we are stuck in our heads. And being stuck in our heads is a, is a, it's a downward spiral of, mm. of uh, creative despair, really. Yeah, it's interesting. As you were describing this, um, I uh, passed by a local Hobby Lobby uh, in my area here. And um, uh, the other day I saw um, uh, there was a, on the bulletin board, they were advertising uh, um, drawing lessons. And I, I always, always wanted to draw, I, I swear. But I, you know, just things happened, you know, the life situation uh, kind of sort of kept me away from, from exploring this, right? And it's like, oh, I got to do this. You know, one day I have to do this. I, I got to do this. I took this thing, I put it on my desk, and I'm looking at it every day, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. And there's this pool, but then I'm thinking, God, look, you're like, you're a grown up, man. <laughs> you're almost 50. What are you trying to do here? You're going to go and take these classes with these grandmas and start drawing. You know, you, you're going to suck at it too. You know, and, and on my, but, but the other part is saying, but you're going to love expressing yourself, you know, movement and all, who got, you know, and who cares how good this is, you know, just, yes. just uh, the activity, just that you were saying that this energy is, is asking to get out. It wants to get out and express, right? So I want to, I want to give it, you know, <laughs> give it what it's looking for, you know? So, and I'm still kind of was like on the fence, you know, but uh, you might, <laughs> you might just <laughs> have convinced me now. <laughs> you know? Well, that re that, listen yeah. to how that strong that resistance is, right? About it I'm too old is to do this. It's yeah. not going to look good, right? Yeah. You're worrying about what it's going to look like, right? Versus like you have this other energy, which is about, oh, there's this thing in me that I haven't tapped yet. It's been asking to come out. I want to discover yeah. it. And so it's by entering this field of discovery, yeah. right? Of what we're learning, of what, I'm, what you can grow into in the creative mm -hmm. process. Not about, can I make something look good? Right. But the question of what it looks like is a question of how am I going to look? That's the same question as how do I look to mm -hmm. other people? Mm -hmm. How will other people yeah. perceive me? Versus how can I just let this thing come out? That part of it, but also purpose. what purpose is that going to? I mean, okay, so you went there. I'm kind of sort of like already jumping ahead and thinking, okay, you have done it. You're looking at your artwork satisfied now? You've done it. <laughs> so... So what, you know? Well, so that's, this is also potentially, you know, this is stepping outside of your comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Right. And this is potentially the doorway to something really big. You yeah, never know. Absolutely. And absolutely. Maybe yeah. it's not drawing, but maybe that will lead you to, maybe there's somebody at the class that you're going to meet who, who's. I will definitely meet amazing, people. Right? And no matter who they are, I know yeah. with my current mindset and I, I will, I know I'll enjoy that, those connections for sure. Yeah. It's for this sure. is what we keep learning over yeah. and over is we yeah, don't know what yeah. the hell's going to happen. Absolutely. You, you know? go there and uh, you know what? It, it's either this way or another way. Uh, maybe if you have another podcast, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll update you what, uh, what finally happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said the, like this is the last I'll one. show you how, how much I suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about like how you, um, you know, how easy it is for your mind to jump ahead. Yeah. Right? Like oh, you're yeah. getting excited about the process of mm -hmm. doing something new. 
mm-hmm. and of letting this thing that's coming, trying to come out, come out. And then you jump ahead to, but what will it all mean in the end? Yeah. At the end of it, how will I judge it? Mm-hmm. Right? And that's just like, you're getting, out of the, you're getting out of that present energy that's in you and you're mm-hmm. already trying to put a, a lid on it right? and saying, well, you know, yeah, it might, it's probably something that might be kind of fun, but right. And sort of you're, you're already, get, you're already projecting out, putting yourself out into the future, which yeah. doesn't exist. Right? And, and that has the potential to, if you co- go into it with that attitude, that has a potential to, qu- to squash that energy in the process. Right. But if you go into the process with this openness of what might happen here, might happen, yeah. right. What might I learn about myself that I didn't know yet? What mysteries have I not even considered that might arise from this big block that I've had about feeling self-conscious about I'm too old or whatever it is, right? Whatever story you've told yourself about why mm-hmm. you haven't learned to draw when you've wanted to. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. your, that's yeah. your, uh, your mother talking to you. Well, the reasons why you, you shouldn't do it, right? Yeah, you know what I think what you talked you about know, in the past thinking, thinking what might've caused this conditioning is that uh, yeah you, you know my uh, my father had uh, always argued okay what utility will this have it has to mm-hmm. have a purpose how will you use it where can you is this a tool it has to be a tool that helps you uh, yeah. do something you see so what can you, you make money from it can you make whatever yeah. whatever else you know how do you, forgetting that the value is also in self discovery in the process in the right. growth in expressing yourself that's the value we don't attach value to it in our society well, that, that's, much. that's what it's a tool for right it is, is the that, thing not, the not tool. exactly, exactly. Yeah. The, the the activity is the tool mm. right mm. yeah so not whatever you produce as a result of that activity so yeah yeah and it's also not even just the thing you produce but something that's being sort of produced constantly in the process is that mm. thing which you don't yet know Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. It's not. It is. It is about that channel of self-expression. But once you open that channel of self-expression, who knows? Think about else? all the possible things yeah. that you're going to learn. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's content there. That's stuff. That's stuff that mm-hmm. actually is commodifiable. Right. You can make money from those things because it's things that you're discovering. And people are so blocked up when it comes to. We, we start asking those questions. Right. Like mm-hmm. your dad is saying. How does what? How can we apply? We jumped it. What is? What's its use in society? What's its value? If it doesn't have a immediate recognizable use, we say, uh, you know, let's stay away from that. Let's focus. Let's focus on what's productive. Mm-hmm, productive Sometimes the most yeah. productive things are the things where you give yourself permission not to produce something, right? <laughs> or not to have an attachment to what it's going to be like in the end. That's when we can feel. That. That's truly what it means to be in the present. Yeah. Okay? To be here's where I am. I'm present with what I'm doing. I'm just going to listen to this body, this world, this activity, these materials, and I'm going to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, something that I don't know if this is a detour or not, but something that just came to me while you were talking about that, Michael, is, is the value of focus. Mm-hmm. And if you're if you're in a creative state, you are focused. But you're not listening to all of the the chatter. The monkey mind is is not there. You're just in, in the flow, you're in the zone, and you're just, you're not even really thinking a lot. You're, you're just yes. present in, with what you're doing. And the value of being able to turn that on is huge. And it, I'm Absolutely. struggling with that. You know, it's because it's, you have, especially for people who have, and entrepreneurs suffer a lot from the, the, you know, the, the squirrel syndrome or the shiny object syndrome, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. It's you get going and you're really fired up about something and and a little ways in the the fire is, is a little less and so you're you're more I don't know susceptible to seeing other things and suddenly you're next thing you know yeah. you're doing something else just as fired up about it. Um, yeah, Aw- yeah. Awareness is the key, right? Awareness of how we are being and interacting with our environment. What What's coming into our minds at any given moment? And how is that driving our decision-making? Right? If we recognize where all the different ways that we've learned to stop our creative flow, because they're, they're constant, right? yeah. unless we have a method for keeping it open. It's tragic. I know what you mean. I almost feel like the tragedy of this. I mean, we are constantly suppressing ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Every, moment to moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that, 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 but that's the key is that, that question that, that Tim, you just brought up. It's an, it's an awareness. It's becoming aware mm-hmm. of what's happening in your mind and in your body so that you can recognize when you start to spin off in, say, that uh, hour that you just wasted trying to make something perfect. Right? When we get into this idea of making something perfect or doing it the right way, we're dealing with that question again of our image and our, like looking good and looking, like, wanting it to be right, right? Mm-hmm. versus wanting it to be real. And if we can keep coming back to the present moment, I mean, this shows how it's so hard to keep coming back to the present moment, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. a lifelong struggle to keep, to, to, to keep at this because we know that that's the only place where things are real. Right? That's where we can feel exactly what's coming through us and create from that space. Um, and, you know, there are little tricks you can, you can use to, I mean, a, a lot of it is just sort of like recording it, like what happens, making a note every time a thought comes into your head. Like when, what is that thought? What's the nature of those thoughts? Is it a negative thought? Does it say that, um, does it say that you're upset about something? Does it say you can't do something? Does it say you're scared of something? Are you mm-hmm. thinking about someone else's voice coming in as a judgment of this? I mean, that's very mm-hmm. often the story is, what is this person going to think mm-hmm. that I'm going to share this with? And how do they think about me now? And what am I afraid to find out what I might become if I just let go of this way that I'm thinking about myself now as this person who um, needs to keep up an image as someone who's not uh, so um, innocent enough or silly enough or uh, um, just simply joyful enough to do something that I love, Mm -hmm. like take a drawing class. (laughs) <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> or a dance class or that's whatever a, it is. That's a, well, he, yeah, Gabby wanted to do that too, and then he changed his mind. Oh, no, no let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, that, you know, the, you got into a lot of self-inquiry, which is, is, I mean, it's so important if you want to, if you want to grow, I mean, but it, and it sounds, as it's coming out of my mouth, even before it came out of my mouth, I'm thinking it sounds kind of pompous. But, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying and you're and you you become unhappy and miserable and you make the people around you miserable and and you don't even know why. But if you're if you're doing just the simplest stuff, man, like like even if you don't take a class, if you just go and say, you know what, I'm just going to take some paper and some crayons and I'm going to fool around. It's 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 that's going to be a creative thing. It's a it's a releasing of some of that energy, right? It's it's yeah. I, I don't know. Moves you forward somehow. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's resp- it's listening to yourself, right? If there's something that's it's in you. So like, you know, I have a I have a a good artist friend of mine, Mo- Morgan O'Hara. She does these beautiful drawings. Um, she's been doing this for th- a few decades now, where she holds bunches of pencils in her hands and she syncs up her hand movements to the hand movements or body movements of other people who are either performers or just one of my favorite um, Ah. uh, ones is uh, an asparagus picker (laughs) and someone who's in the field picking asparagus. And it's just, I don't know how long it is, but she calls them um, live transmissions where she's transmitting the energy of the movement of someone else onto paper. And in a very fundamental sense, these are representational drawings and they're very realistic in that sense, right? There's a connection with reality. And we have this tendency to use this word realism when we talk about art to sort of mean photographic realism, as if the photograph has some sort of special, um, uh, you know, purchase on the nature of our experience. We sort mm-hmm. of tend to think it is because we value the way that our eyes, well, we, we've grown up looking at two-dimensional images our entire lives. And so anyways, we don't want to necessarily go down that path, but the, I brought up Morgan O'Hara because um, what were we talking about right before that? I forget. Um, uh, oh, shoot. oh, just the releasing, uh, releasing, just being creative for the sake of being creative, just crayons and, and just releasing some energy. Yeah, no, that wasn't exactly it, but, um, shoot. Ah, it'll come to you. Good point that I was going to make. As soon as you let it go, it'll come back to you. <laughs> but think, you're, you're segueing into the other, to the, um, well, I think that, that's interesting that she earlier. does when she does that when she chooses to do that, right? She basically does not kind of sort of like wait for inspiration to express. She chose a method, right? 
I'm going to uh, get my data from the physical movement, right? That, I think that's where that's kind of a different approach to to art, right? Now the question is: Is it still art? Because I well, mean, yeah, you, that's you a project, question in your in your mind. I'm thinking uh, you're projecting. I mean, you, it's interesting what will come out from this, right? Uh, what kind of interesting, uh, you know, representations of these movements, uh, how it will render on uh, uh, on a paper or whatever other media, right? It'd be interesting to see. I, I, I enjoy some of the video installations at museums, right? Um, and sometimes very interesting effects. And could it, could it, could we call it art? Uh, that's another question. But it, it definitely is another manifestation that that has a right to exist and to, to be like you know received, you know, and and enjoyed possibly, you know. So yeah, you know. Yeah, again, I mean, and I'll come back to that. Like that yeah. question of what we call it, whether we call it art or not is not really an interesting question to me. Yeah. But what does it move in you? Does it move something in you? That's the interesting question. And if it does. Yeah what is it moving and how is it moving that? And what's the nature of that connection with that energy? And I did remember what I was gonna say about Morgan O'Hara. It wasn't actually about her, this particular artwork, but she, um, uh, she uh, turned me on to a book about the, um, it was about, basically about children's drawings and um, how children start to make marks. And there's a certain sort of vocabulary of mark making that all children use, which is based <clears throat> in the physical development of their bodies and how they're growing and how they're learning to manipulate um, tools. And um, when she's done workshops, uh, going through these, I think it's like 20 different basic forms, like the straight line, the curved line, the circle, the spiral. She has adults do these exercises as warm-ups in her workshops, and invariably they start crying mm -hmm. as they're doing this. Mm -hmm. right? Because they're connecting to this energy that their bodies remember, but is no longer able to express, mm -hmm. right? And has been waiting to come out. And so Tim, your example, which you sort of, you know, getting some paper and some crayons and starting to making some scribbles. Yeah, I mean, on the surface, it looked, okay, maybe it feels like you're being a toddler again. But the value of letting that, opening that channel again, and letting that blocked energy that's been blocked for so long to come out, in whatever way it is, you can, you can, you can, use whatever uh, um, you know, image here you want to, but uh, whether it's like going out and for going for a run, right? The way that that allows that energy to move. Getting crayons and just making scribbles. That's, a same, that's, a, that's a physical movement too that allows that energy to move. You know, whatever it is. We have this sort of like, there's a way in which we use the word crayon and we think, oh, crayons, kids do that. Finger paints, crayons, right? Adults don't do that, mm -hmm. but there's value in tapping into this. And there's, there's this, this question of, um, you know, the thing that you brought up about it being sort of tragic, Gabi, about like this, we're constantly fighting against this energy and saying all these stories to ourselves, telling us about, we're not allowed to do this. Adults don't do this. Yeah. Mature people don't do this. Right. You know, yeah. who's, telling, who's, who's, who's telling us those stories? Like, we, we can look back and say, I remember how those stories got in there, but we're the ones that are telling these stories to ourselves over and over again. There's no one yeah. actually there telling us that. No. Or if there are, we need to recognize that too. But Parents, yeah. parents do, though. I mean, parents, parents do, oh, yeah. parents yeah. do to children yeah. at some point, as you were describing in the beginning, right? At some point, uh, parents start guiding you. It was an amazing thing. You know that uh, babies when they're born, uh, you know, shortly after, in the first three, uh, three to six months, I think, um, they are able to generate any sound uh, from any language, right. from any language. Uh, some of the things that they would later just really just uh, lose the, the ability to reproduce. So within, uh, I think after six months, almost half of the neurons, you know, die off they just die off because there's a selection okay uh, we need to survive in this environment and mm. so what is being stimulated these cells so uh, they're gonna go on leaving the others we need to let go of i mean die can't so and that's how you constantly being kind of sort of like narrowed down to whatever the 
the thing, the path that your life situation that you're going to have to join and adapt to, right? Yeah. And then the parents are the other components that start kind of filtering out. Okay, you don't need this, you don't need that. And some parents will say, forget about this art. This doesn't make money. It doesn't, and forget about talking of this fantasizing thoughts, you know, this creative thinking. It didn't pay anybody. I don't know. You, you know, better go and get, you know, study math or whatever. I want to be a starving artist. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. You know, how many musicians we know, like, okay, my mom and dad asked me to go to law school and I, I really wanted to be a good kid and I did that, but uh, three yeah. years into it, I dropped off, you know, I dropped out and then went to, to, to pursue this, right? All the time. So we are doing this to ourselves. Um, uh, but the parents are doing this, right? And that's while the art, wouldn't you say, art now is most accessible to the masses that uh, it has ever been, right? I mean, everywhere, right? And still this goes on. Is that because our climate, our, our, our society, the way it's built, is really not valuing art? Is that because we are in a climate of valuing uh, material, material symbols, material possessions, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, utility of them, and uh, energy, and a uh, way of consuming uh, you know, energy resources. Yeah. But not, not necessarily um, appreciating that particular energy that comes from art, right? They just didn't give it enough value, but it's happening though. I see it. I see this. Well, um, it's it's yeah. mindset stuff, right? It's the mindset as, a, you as go people back to, get more to like, yeah. or like 100 years ago, yeah. right? People, you know, a lot of, a lot of it is affluence mm -hmm. because you have money, you have time. Yeah. Right? You can buy, buy yourself freedom, time yeah. freedom. But, you know, I don't know how far back you got to go, but there was a time when it, you just worked. That's what life was just about working. You know, and the very few people had the luxury of, of being creative, being artists in whatever form. And that mm -hmm. stuff, because of the nature of, uh, well, technology is what's changing everything, right? And the communications of new ideas coming forward is what allows people we're in a great position today because we're totally. we're able to look back and see what you know our parents and grandparents what they came out of and the mindset that they they're so stuck with most of them right mm -hmm. and we're sort of in between and we've kind of had this conversation before we're sort of in between that we still have a lot of that residue that's that's part of our psyches but we can see what's possible too we can see that yeah, it's possible to change. We can see that we could be so much more than we are, and we're accepting of those ideas. Your kids, Gabby, and and kids after that, they're they're just going to be. It'll, it'll be a no brainer for them. They're going to live in a different world. It's going to be much more of a, a a creative. Just let's let's just do whatever the heck. What's your idea today? Okay, that's what we'll do for a living today. Tomorrow we'll do something else. You know. Absolutely, our generation, our uh, like parents of uh, of my generation. I mean, you cannot even compare the messaging that uh, is in our family to the to my parents, for example. Yeah. It was a very restrictive disciplinary. Even in, even in the same generation, yeah. mm -hmm. I saw with your it was Lana's brother, right? That came. And oh yeah, his wife and how they're they're still in that other paradigm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? and you guys are are in this paradigm. And you know what happened? We moved out. That's another thing, by the way. That you like you know finding uh, that peace and finding that uh, ability to connect uh, and align. If you're surrounded by people on the uh, uh you know who who are not sharing the same kind of desires with you yeah I mean, you just moved out that has made a huge difference you know because you cannot be like so solitude sometimes you know really helped i know um einstein einstein when he was giving one of his interesting speeches he said although I, i'm paraphrasing he said although i am um, very socially conscious and caring right i i have to say that i find 
peace and solitude and I find myself um, removed from all my family and friends and oftentimes I'm a loner, right? I'm a loner because um, it's so much easier to find peace and be connected to your being without having to care about what other people uh, feel or think and try to satisfy them or whatever. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, so we, we move that. And that's what happens, people. Uh, well, that's another thing. Remember, we were talking about where's free will, right? The biggest part of your free will is choosing your environment mm. consciously, like getting yourself into the environment that vibrates, you know, satisfies your desires, your, your wants, right? Uh, and that really helps, yeah. You know, on the question about uh, children and how open they are, um, uh, you know, with creativity and all, um, you would think like we are doing it to ourselves, right? But don't you think that there is um, a built-in systemic suppression of creative powers because the society, the, the few need to actually, or, you know, this is the aim of the society, to shut down the creative powers of the majority of the population because of this belief that, uh, you know, if everybody starts creating suddenly or uh, express themselves through whatever means and become truly free, that would be the end of the system as we know it. You know, where everyone, as a matter of fact, you know, many people don't realize, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when the Soviets decided, you know, got inspired by the idea of communism, right? Communism had two parts to it. The first was to unshackle the oppressed, the proletariat, right? Unshackle them the and take the means of production into their own hands right but the second part was to empower the uh, the creative powers the, to to give people back the freedom to create to express themselves freely right and so they did the first part the soviets they unshackled right and then they didn't get to the second part. They got into a trap again of controlling the masses somehow, right? So they unshackled it from one way of oppressing the creative powers only to get caught into in, in, an, in another system of controlling that power, right? And creative power never got basically, un, uh, you know, sort of like unlocked. You know, it was just a... You know, you you came from one by name only. to another by name, exactly. And yeah. people now give really bad. Uh, you know, communism has a bad rap, but it really wasn't. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was never achieved, or in not even you know, not even close. You know, in that society. So, in that sense, right, so let's can we come back to yeah, sort of where we're. Where we're going loosely. All, interest, all interesting questions, but yeah, children, yeah creative yeah. powers of children. Yeah. Where you know we were talking about, <clears throat> you know, it, I guess it's it's not an interesting question for some, but for others, for example, me who is raising kids, right? How do you, uh, you know, n not stand in the way of their creative, uh, you know, creative? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think I have kids too, I've, um, and. Uh, it's what you said. Don't stand in the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way. And create conditions for them to have that exploration and for them to direct to that exploration themselves. Right? We can set them up with, we can help them create the mindset and the conditions for how to go about this process. And it's very difficult as parents when um, it, it can be when your child comes up and shows you something they made. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to do is ask, how do you respond to that? Because your response is giving them a message about what it means, right? So if your response is, that's wonderful, this mm -hmm. is beautiful. If that's the message to every single thing they create, right? Yeah. When they stop 
well, one, when they stop getting those messages, they won't feel like it's worth it anymore. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we're also not getting them to um, understand and value the process, right? So instead of asking, so I always like to come back to what questions can we ask children? That's a great question. About yeah. their process or about what yeah. they're doing rather than because it's so easy to go, oh, what's that? What's that thing? What's that? And then it's just this like identifying game. That's a house. That's a tree. That's daddy. Whatever it is, right? Uh, okay. You know, that's on one level that there's a space for that. It's not like you can't have that conversation, but what's more important, um, but to develop their love and their joy of finding and being in that flow without any reason to please anyone else. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes, I mean, with my own doing it because they want to show me something, right? They want a little, they want some praise. And um, when I recognize that, I try to, I mean, it's just my thing. I try to, uh, first of all, genuinely respond like, with what I feel, what I, what I feel about it. And mm -hmm. if it's something that I've seen them do before, because often it is, it's like, I recognize they're just, re they're repeating themselves. And so that's an opportunity to engage in, how are you feeling when you make this? What's, what's, what are you thinking about when, you, when you're drawing this? Tell me about this process, mm -hmm. right? Why did you choose to do this part here and what can you tell me about that part there? Right. So these questions that allow further investigation, that will allow them to go inward and to get more connected with what's happening internally, even if they don't have the language for it, you can do this with, you know, three-year-olds um, mm -hmm. by, by sort of exploring. And on another, you know, the other really important part of this is that we have to model this ourselves. We know that our kids are learning to model us. Like the way that we're living our lives is how they are learning that they are to operate in the world. So if we want them to be creative, we also need to embody that and put that into our lives. We need to show that we are doing things that are just joyful and risk-taking and trying new things and are stepping out of our own comfort zone. Right? As you can, it's so easy. We, I see it with my daughter right now or, uh, or my son right now with drawing um, uh, uh, I can't remember what it was. I think it was a shoe. It's like, here's how you draw a shoe. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how you draw a shoe? Where'd you learn how to draw that shoe? I can't remember. Maybe it's at school or something. Or you, what a, have, are there other ways you could draw a shoe? Like, no, this, this way of drawing a shoe works. Oh, take out my shoe, put it on the table. What about, we draw, what about this way? What about this way? What if we draw with our left hand? Mm -hmm. What if we draw it only from, through a sense of touch? Mm -hmm. This is, you know, I, I keep... This keeps coming up in conversation for me, and I keep talking about this. It, it, you, it's critical thinking to teach your kids, right? And if, if you're doing that kind of thing with them, every time they come in and just announce something to you, and you question, not, not in, a, in a critical way, but you question, okay, cool, what, you know, what's, what are the components that are going to let you do that? You know, what's, what does it take to, you know, the example I usually use is a kid that comes up and announces he's going to be a cowboy. You know, oh, that's nice. But, you know, do you need a horse? Where are you going to get a horse? What do, what do horses eat? Do you have to buy a horse? Can you rent a horse? What's it, Whatever the questions might be, you know. But you get them to start. They will start to do it for themselves as they go through life. And it will just make them better decision makers and make them more self-aware. Yeah. And they're just so much better equipped going forward. And then they will question authority in a productive way, right? Not just... Right challenge authority but it'll be okay you're telling me this is how things are supposed to be done does that make sense you know is there is there another way to do this same thing maybe more efficient way you know and, and what's the reason that that you know they start to ask better questions yeah of life in general yeah when it's you so start to better. honor their questions um, and show them how you honor your own questions and, and that how that you are also full of questions mm. those questions drive you to create what you want to create right? and how you struggle with it sometimes, right? And how you struggle with the whole idea of external validation, right? And how others think about you. I mean, this is the, all kids are dealing with this in school, you know, with their, with fitting in, right? This is something that we learn very early. And the more that we can embody the way that we want to be, you know, the highest version of ourselves, the more that they are, are going to follow us. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and, and by honoring their questions, I don't mean just like, giving them space to have their quote unquote childish questions, 
It's like actually taking an interest in, it's actually coming in with the attitude that I, as an adult, have something really important that I could learn from this child. They have a, they're, they're in a space where they can teach me something. What is it? How can I ask the questions that will allow me to learn what's going on inside of them? Because it's foreign to me, right? Just because I was a child doesn't mean I understand exactly what they're going through. They're their own individual being. And right. if I engage them in the questions that are driving them to make that picture, you know, whatever it is, or I'm using drawing as an example, um, I can better understand their own psyche, their own emotions, what they're dealing with, why it's coming through them in this manner, not in a place of like assessing or judging and, and comparing, but of love, right? And saying, this is like, I, I see this in you. I see you. I see that you're coming, that this is coming out of you. And I honor that. Mm-hmm. You know, it strikes me that it's also an opportunity going back to what you were talking about a minute ago, Gabby, with the, you know, the, pl- the programs that we're running that came from parents and we, we have to maybe keep in mind that, that an adult may have said something to us perfectly rationally and, and lovingly and with great intention. And it may be a very innocent thing that they said to us, mm-hmm. but it doesn't matter if we twisted it somehow as we heard it mm-hmm. for that person. That's not what was said. Right. But if you're able to question your kids and, and, you know, I got to believe that every once in a while you're going to get a light bulb come on and go, oh, oh, this came from what they think I said, you know, and you get an opportunity to, to redirect, you mm-hmm. know, I almost use the word correct them, but it's, you know, you can, you can give them another perspective on that. Yeah. You know, it's a, I, there's so many benefits, I think. Yeah. To begin with, I, well, that's one, th- one thing I stopped doing uh, is always saying what you were saying, Michael, oh, this is great. This you like, everywhere you go to a daycare center i you know we used to go to moms are always like very emotional <laughs> expressing you know how wonderful their children are and i was like hey, these are powerful programs i mean you're right i mean there's praise and children are like oh, okay mommy liked it i'm gonna do more of that you know so <laughs> and I'm I like, on that piece of plastic. And I, I'm watching them. I was like, if you only knew what you're installing right now in these kids, I mean, it's going to be so hard to now later on to find true selves, you know, and you're going to get this wonderful, compliant, you know, members of society who will follow instructions for praise, you know, just, you know, and not be able to think for themselves, right? That's not, I stopped doing that, that for sure. But, you know, as far as the response, the best I came up with is what, Michael, you were saying, like, don't overthink it. Uh, spend time and when you reach the, you know, when you're in the, in the present, when you're in the moment, the authentic response will come. It won't be mind produced. It won't be mind generated. It will be authentic inspiration. It might even be criticism. Who cares? You know, I, you know, I, I mean, I, well, my kid is into, you know, everybody, I guess. They're making slime. You know what slime is? Have they already ruined a couple of your carpets or whatever? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, part of that uh, is glue. You know, one of the components is glue. <laughs> it's hard, hard to remove from anywhere. <laughs> Anyways, so I mean, there's damage, damage everywhere from the slime. But on the other hand, it, it, he is really into it. He's creative. <laughs> I mean, because there's texture to it and color and they, they kind of press it like dough, you know, it makes bubbling sound like something is like exploding or whatever. And it's incredible uh, sensation, you know, t- uh, the, um, you know? Yeah. So I even got myself into it. Yeah. They put some rules around this, you know, it has to be outdoors, you know, whatever. You know, and so yeah, we put slime to service now. <laughs> creative. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you a story about my uh so um both my kids actually, but mostly my son would would go around the house. This is over a year ago now, um drawing on the walls. Oh my God, really? Yeah, and like these little, not like big, like I'm being rebellious drawing on the walls. Like I'm going over and I'm going to draw on the walls secretly. Uh, mm. Knowing that they kind of, you know, knowing that it's not, they're not supposed to. So now I, you know, as an artist and a drawer and a drawer that draws on walls, um, 
<laughs> I have a hard time just saying no to this gesture, to this impulse. Yeah. Right. So this is something that I struggled with. I would, um, you know, for a while it was about cleaning it off and erasing it and uh, saying that these are the rules and no drawing on the wall, drawing on paper. Um, but when they did draw on the walls, I couldn't help but to say two things. One, let's remember our, our house rule about not drawing on the walls, mm -hmm. which opens up another question of like, why not? Right. right. Which is, and if you just come out with, well, that's just the rule, they know that's bullshit. not going to hold water. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, know, they yeah. really need to understand why it's not okay. And then, so that made me ask, why is it not okay? What yeah. really is at stake here? Right, with them drawing on the walls. It means I have to more clean up for me later. Could, I, could they potentially draw on the walls more? Could that be a good thing? Right? Mm -hmm. So often I would, um, and while I was struggling with this, I would find myself asking them to remember not to draw on the walls because I have to clean it up or have to paint over it later. Or, or remember that when you go to other people's houses, you can't do this because that would happen sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but at the same time, I couldn't help but to... Um, respect their boldness in doing this and their desire to explore this boundary right? and to draw on walls. I mean, I love drawing on walls. Not in a rebellious sort of, well, I don't know. There's a part of me that's always a, like yeah, the, artist, yeah. the, the rebel in me that like, that, res that honors and respects that in them and wants to see, yeah. and doesn't want to quell that. Yeah. Right? At the same time, I have to have rules too of the house. And it's okay yeah. for those two things. That's the thing that we sort of we, we get into that thing of either or again. It's okay for those two things to come together, right? You can both honor some qualities while also trying to respect others, right? Or other conditions. Um, yeah. At the same time, being able to make it, make them not, how do you, how do you, how do you encourage creativity without putting the lid on, on it in other ways. Uh, designate a wall that that be approved for. Sure, I mean that's one solution, right? Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's something that we tried actually uh, for a little bit. Well, kids, kids, you know, part of their job is pushing the envelope. Yeah, they and maybe all of us, but kids in particular, they, you know, they they push your buttons, right? And they they push the boundaries of what they can get away with. Yeah, just to see how far they can go. You know, and I don't know that that there's any more purpose to it than that. Maybe I don't but know that they're, it's, they're, it's my like kid is not testing. Job. That's what they're hired for. Is <laughs> I mean, that, that's, how you, sometimes. that's how you see it, Tim. My kid yeah. doesn't have this motivation to challenge my, uh, like you know, how far he could push me, right? Uh, where my authority would um, start, like, will kick into uh, you know gear and say no, no more, no more on that, right? So. You know, as far as um, allowing them to express themselves creatively, um, you know, my my kid asked the same question that Michael, you're saying, why not? And like your yourself, when I go to the to the deep meaning of why not, you know, because I keep asking because this answer is not good, doesn't doesn't work. Let's go deeper. Why not? Why? Why the hell not? At the core of it, yeah. why not? Right? There is no answer. It should be allowed. What? What? What are you? Are you going to betray your child's creative, uh, you know, pursuits for the material, you know, uh, look of that uh, of that wall? Who cares? It's something so much more valuable and meaningful, right? That would later on it would be just amazing. You know, what will come out from this? Or if you kick this rule into uh, uh, existence, it will just kill something amazing, potentially, right? So, yeah. But is there, is there something wrong with saying, you know, here, here's a blank wall, Yeah. As just as an example. Here's, here's a space yeah. for you to be as creative as you want to be. Yeah. Have at it. Yeah. And, and this is off limits. I think, I think there's, not, there's nothing... Um, wrong about that asking that question in that way, right? Mm -hmm. But look at what's behind that question. So you have to going going to the question of why not is the question, right? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why only this wall? 
Why does art need to fit inside this part? Yeah, the, the, Why is it not continue. allowed over in this part of the house? Why is it not allowed in this part of society? Why is it not allowed in this particular work mm -hmm. environment? Right, this, that's the natural extension of those questions. Mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, we wanna be able to house these energies. We, we create mm -hmm. boundaries so we, that we can harness these energies, but we wanna create mm -hmm. them in a conscious way too. So that, as long as we understand that this is the space for art, and this is where art can thrive, and this is not the space for drawing on the walls. I mean, those are boundaries that are this is perfectly, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we also have to ask ourselves within that same question is, yeah. why not? We have to ask ourselves that because within that is a, there's another layer of meaning. And mm -hmm. if it's not okay to have creative self-expression in this space, mm -hmm. what does that imply about what we value what we allow when we allow it why we allow it those sorts of questions mm -hmm. right so it's not about making yeah. anyone right or wrong it's right. about being conscious of how we're drawing those boundaries and harnessing those energies and encouraging or quelling them right mm -hmm. because we, because we know if there, that are, we if there are no boundaries then you just have chaos uh, right i'm not i'm not trying to make an argument for no boundaries yeah. i'm trying to make an argument for let's be very conscious about why we draw the boundaries we need to draw and how those boundaries serve us or don't. Mm. Right? Because, they, don't we come because, back to balance? Yeah. And that what a big piece of this is is you know, you you can be super creative, mm -hmm. but in some other part of your life you've gotta you gotta take a shower once in a while. You need to harness the energies in the right way. Yeah. Right? You need to yeah. attend to yourself. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you know, you can be uh, you can't be drawing twenty four seven. Yeah. Right? Or mm -hmm. whatever the creative activity is, but you can yeah. be consciously present in what you're doing 24 yeah. seven right? or at least in your waking hours and um, you can be conscious. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's about recognizing the value of those containers that we create yeah. and how those could create those containers um, nurture us and nourish us versus mm -hmm. don't. Right. I mean, there's, it's all about how we frame it and how we maintain those lines. Right, which is, for me, is such a beautiful drawing metaphor, which is all about creating lines and boundary, bounded situations right, to contain mm -hmm. energies of things or feelings or whatever they are. Um, so in the same way that in that sense, I sort of tend to think about all of life and all of the marks that we make as um, gestures of drawing, gestures of delineation, gestures of uh, creation, which allow energies to move along certain pathways. That could be a great uh, drawing, uh, Michael, right? To, to somehow express this idea, right? The, the designated space and the boundaries, right? And how do you, like, I, I don't know how it might manifest itself, you know, in the, in the visual, you know, as, a, as an art uh, piece, right? And, and that example I'm dealing with now is with video games. Mm -hmm hours and hours of video games and I needed to put, and they're amazing. I mean, the, I took out all the violent games or bad games, you know, some, some of the games my kid is playing are really creative. You know, they get to uh, basically, um, there's a socialization that there's a, um, um, you know, the cooperation component when he is allied with other kids to, to pursue some goals or whatever. They create objects from just typing some lines of um, whatever code and something right gets right into the in their hands, you know, so tools or whatever. So I really came to respect that time, but I see him at that for hours and hours, and I realize that I need to put some boundaries. So how do you how do you, I communicate this, right? And the best thing I could come up with was really explaining what happens when you sit for many hours, you know, to your body and how you, you know, trying to really um, kind of sort of like not just enforce them blindly, but try to persuade, you know, through uh, providing, you know, meaningful arguments that uh, we need to balance here, right? Won't hear a word of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> it doesn't work. I was like, uh, and the question is, why God created me so I gain weight when I don't move? <laughs> <laughs> Why did he do that? <laughs> you know? Keep it up. You're going to be able to ask him in person yourself. <laughs> you know? 
you know. So, so yeah, so I, it, at some point, basically, um, you know, we came up with this idea as a computer holiday to put mm -hmm. a positive spin on it, you know. You know, computer holiday. <laughs> and on that day, a lot of interesting activities are planned and Wi-Fi goes off. Mm -hmm. You know, right. So maybe it yeah. works. You know, I, I we're pushing two hours yeah. here, guys. So um, I want to go to we're gonna we're gonna just change gears a little bit. Uh, I want to go to this exercise I was talking about earlier because Michael, this is something you did at the event where we met. You had a whole room full of people doing this, and I was fascinated watching it taking place and to see the results. So, and you know what I'm talking about, right? You're talking about the. The blind contour drawing or the wall sit drawing? No, the, the, the contour drawing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so would you, you're going to do a much better job of explaining what it is in the, and what the value is of it to people sure. than I would. Sure. And you're the yeah, guest, so, so I'm going to make you do the works. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so um, I, first of all, thinking about a contour, what a, what a contour is. A contour um, visually is an edge of something. And it doesn't necessarily mean an outer edge. It just means any edge between forms or between a form and some, between forms. But visually, when we see, so if you think about, first of all, just contours on a mountain, mm -hmm. right? So you understand the contour of the mountain by walking along it, right? That shows you the line. It becomes this sort of visual thing on a map, on a topographic map. It's a line that doesn't actually exist visually, right? But we know it to be a, a structural thing of the mountain. So looking at any objects outside of yourself or even your own hand, which is what we did in the exercise, um, as, uh, so if you can imagine, um, the contours on any object change when you shift your perspective, right? So contours are also perceptual. They're not actual physical things. Um, although some of them are, right? So if, like in my hand, for example, uh, I can maybe use this pen here. So like this, the, these grooves in my hand, like that's actually a contour that I can fall into and like a, you know, a valley and I can like feel that contour. It's a, it is a physical thing. Whereas others like the outer boundary of my hand are not actual physical tactile things. They're created by what your eyes see as a separation between the space around it and the object itself, right? That's not an actual physical line because now it just disappeared. Right. So anyways, in a blind contour exercise, we have this, um, because of our, uh, our habitual association of two-dimensional photographs with reality, we have a tendency to think about um, the way something looks as, uh, well, real as being a reflection of our real experience. Um, where there's a sense for also that, think about, um, well, I, I'm getting a little off track. I could go kind of deep into this perceptual thing, but maybe I'll, I'll try to stay on ta task here and get back to describing you know, it. No, we can do it. Let's, yeah, let's, um, let's try to stay a little bit surface and then, you know, maybe, we can bring you back another time and sure. we can do a show that's specifically, of, we can show you the results and... Yeah, and let me describe the exercise. Yeah. So imagine you're holding something in your hand like a pen, okay? And I'm gonna draw with this other hand. But I'm gonna look at this pen and my hand and I'm gonna draw this object, the hand and the pen. And I'm gonna imagine that my eyes are touching this edge of the pen or some part of the pen before I start to draw. Now, it's called a blind contour exercise because I am blind to the paper. Yeah, I'm not looking at the paper. I'm only being present and attentive to the environment which I've chosen, which in this case is the pen in the hand. Okay. So when I'm doing a blind contour drawing, I am syncing up the movement of my drawing hand, the feel of the tip of the pencil on the paper with the sensation of my eyes moving along the contours which I see. Mm -hmm. And so by doing this, you're creating a drawing that is in sync with you, your hand is in sync with your eyes. So mm -hmm. what you have here is the visual information coming from the object to your eyes, through your body, out through the other hand and onto the paper right? and mm -hmm. coordinating that you know, in a way that's, that makes it feel connected to each other. So when you do this, you can't see what's on the paper. Right. right? There's no feedback loop. Yeah. 
there's no visual feedback, right? No visual but feedback. you can sort of sense where you are in general on the paper. So you can sort of feel your way back and forth. Mm. And it, in doing this, it allows you to be fully present with your environment here, right? Because you have no concern over what's happening on the paper. Okay. Or so you think. <laughs> it's very difficult to control because we're conditioned to worry about what this looks like. What does this drawing look like? We think that the beauty in art is all about the way it looks. Right. And so we're concerned with what, what this is kind of the same question of uh, what's it all going to mean at the end of the drawing class? What's this drawing going to mean at the end if I can't even control what's happening? Here? Mm -hmm. But the truth is you are controlling what's happening there. You're just not controlling it in the way you're used to control. Right. You are fully able to be present with whatever you're drawing and the way that your hand is moving. And the more that you are present with that, mm -hmm. funnily, that's how the more realistic, quote unquote, that drawing looks because you spent the time and put the energy into that focus. So anyways, what happens in this exercise is invariably you got people peeking, they're like take stealing glances, right. or they're kind of using their peripheral vision to guide them a little bit, or they just take little quick little peeks to make sure that things line up. <laughs> and so this is a really interesting process because what it reveals to you is the way that your mind operates. What kind of stories come into your head while you're drawing about your drawing, about yourself. I you see. Silly, are you able to give yourself over to the, to the process or not? Do you start to worry about what it's going to look like? When you share it with someone else, what do you say about it? Like, oh, you know, do you, do, do, you, do you start to say, oh, this is, you know, yours is so much better yeah. than mine. Oh, look at that, right? Yeah. It brings up this idea of like how we compare and how we judge. And we're constantly doing this. Like this is a constant voice in our heads that's that's directing us and judging yeah. and stopping that's us from great. that's a great very curious yeah absolutely yeah. and and also um uh, you know you have a drive of getting it right and you want to get rid of that too you want to let go of that too right you know of, of trying to to be accurate in your representation of that uh right and yeah. who cares you know but i mean if you fully present there, focusing on the contour of the pen, and you, you are just throwing out everything else, just really being focused there in the moment, are you seeing that people are getting, uh, I, I don't care if they do, but are you seeing that people are getting uh, close to being accurate? Yeah. Well, in fact, um, this was the first lesson I ever learned in drawing class, mm -hmm. and it was the one skill that at least on the surface, visually, mm -hmm. um, uh, enabled me to draw with greater accuracy mm -hmm. most quickly, at least in, term, in terms of that type of like visual um, skill of a contour drawing, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, it's by, and it's through the act of not paying attention to your paper, right. visually. It's like the more, because it's about engage, it's a practice, it's like getting involved in the process of looking. Drawing is an opportunity to hone your perception Mm -hmm. not to make something look good and by honing your perception by virtue of that mm -hmm. how much you're engaged in that process automatically your results look closer to the experience of the, the, there's a one-to-one -one uh, relationship between the nature of your perceptual experience and the mm -hmm. thing that you produce so the more that you practice being perceptually present with what's in front of you the more your result is mm -hmm. accurate to that so when you see someone that has sort of a a big mess where there's nothing articulate about the drawing, you know that that's what their eyes were doing too. Their eyes were not paying attention. They were jumping around or moving. And their mind. Paying attention. Right, right. What's that? Right. And their mind too, right? Yeah. What, you know, what's coming to me as you're talking about this is, is that if, if you're truly fully focused, the visuals on, on what you're looking at in your hand, your, your body knows how to draw whatever you want to draw. Yeah, right. Your draw, your body can. You you have no trouble sending. Right? You have no trouble sending commands. Right, uh, but we we have trouble trusting. Signaling like that, we can right? do it. So trusting. I mean, you you start from the beginning point. I'm almost like devising a way of how I would approach it. Right, you wouldn't. Your your the the tip of your uh, pencil will not leave the paper because I. Right. So it has to be there all the time. So you start from the beginning point, and then you just go. You have the perception of how much length there is there, so you could totally control how much of a line length it should be before it makes like a, a little nook, you know, or whatever. 
and goes into a different yeah i i think if you were totally disconnected mm -hmm. from what your hand is doing mm -hmm. psychologically if you just were if you could just leave that alone it'd be very accurate it, you'd mm -hmm. probably get a really a, a mm -hmm. much more accurate you know again in quotes mm -hmm. Uh, Great example to use for for yeah. illustrating. So, it. yeah. What I want to do, Michael, did, did you need something? To, did you want to say something more about this? Oh no, or, I mean, I don't know. I could, I could talk for an hour on <laughs> on blind con contour drawing it. <laughs> okay. So what I want to want to do is a couple of things. I want to um, make a promise to the audience that Gabby and I are going to do this. All right. Um, and uh, you know, because it's it's not going to make for very good listening if we're <laughs> five minutes of silence of us just going oh i wonder what it looks yeah. like um so we'll do this you know after all i'll this do it with my my boy too it's been yeah yeah cool. and and you know we'll we'll post them on uh, the episode page and then uh, along with the show notes and stuff and and so people can see it and if anybody out there does this and wants to share and uh, and obviously comments and and, and experiences would be great to hear from people so, awesome. I just, I just, as I watched, I, and I got to be honest, I didn't do it because I was at the event as support staff, and really I was watching everybody else doing it, and it, it was fascinating to watch some of the people. They struggled so much with not looking over at what what it looks like. Mm -hmm. That was a huge, huge temptation for people. Mm -hmm. It was, it was interesting to watch. And then yeah. you know, at some point, we'll, we should talk about the wall set thing too, because that was. Yeah. Totally. That was something else too. Yeah, but the one thing I wanted to do, want to say about that that desire to keep looking, that's the exact same as the self consciousness we bring to what we look like mm -hmm. and how people are seeing us. Mm -hmm. The same exact impulse that want, that we that we we put into what does this drawing look like? You can just replace that with what do I look like? Yeah. Well, that's that's what we were saying. They're creating. It's a piece of them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, cool. All right, we're running up against time here. Like, Great. You know, well, I got time got away from us, but it was, it's been a super fun conversation. It's been fun. I would love to have you come back, honestly, because uh, I can see it's gone another two hours without even trying. Yeah. Um, but before we let you go, um, first of all, Gabby, any last burning questions? or? Well, I, um, I really didn't know what to expect from this because I, uh, I really only had like a brief – intro but now i see uh, what team was talking about and he promised me that i was going to really have fun with it <laughs> and i did i appreciate that uh, it's great great to meet you michael yes likewise yeah. thank you so much for having me all right so michael time for you to share with uh, anybody out there how do they reach you how do they follow you what what where yeah, you, um, you could follow me on facebook or um i have I, my website is michaelnamkung.com um, and you can reach me there through, yeah, through Facebook or through my website. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And we'll include those, uh, links in the show notes. Awesome. So, all right. Let's call it a day here. Michael, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I knew it would be fun. And, uh, you know, let's do it again. Awesome. All right. We're out. All right. Bye. 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 Hi, this is Tim Starr. Thanks for joining me and Gabi on the, the universe between your ears. We really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us for a little while. And we'd like to see you again. So be sure to subscribe wherever it is you're consuming the podcast from, whether it's YouTube or Stitcher or iTunes or whatever the hell else is out there. We want to see you again. We also want to hear from you. So let us know what you think of each episode. Let us know if you've got an idea for a future episode that you think would be just killer. Absolutely. Let us know. All right. Thanks again, and we will see you next time around. Bye-bye.